friends, the Nether Princess had Brandon here, reading chapter 6 of the journey from platform 9 and 3 quarters. Harry's last month with the Dursleys wasn't fun. True, Dudley was now so scared of Harry he wouldn't stay in the same room. While Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon didn't shut Harry in his cupboard, force him to do anything, or shot at him. In fact, they didn't speak to him at all. Half terrified, half furious, they acted as though any chair with Harry in it were empty. Although this was an improvement in many ways, it did become a bit depressing after a while. Harry kept to his room his, with his new owl for company. He had decided to call her Hedwig, a name that he had found in a history of magic. His school books were very interesting. He lay on his bed reading into the night. Hedwig swooped in and out of the open window as she pleased. It was lucky that Aunt Petunia didn't come in to vacuum anymore because Hedwig kept bringing back dead mice. Every night before he went to sleep, Harry ticked off an another day on the piece of paper he had pinned to the wall, counting down to September the 1st. On the last day of August, he thought that he'd speak up to his aunt and uncle about getting to, getting to King's Cross Station the next day. So he went down to the living room where they were watching a quiz show on television. He cleared, he cleared his throat to let them know that he was there, and Dudley screamed and ran from the room. Uh, Uncle Vernon? Uncle Vernon grunted to show he was listening. Uh, I need to be at King's Cross tomorrow to, to go to Hogwarts. Uncle Vernon grunted again. Would it be all right if you gave me a lift? Grunt. Harry supposed it meant yes. Thank you. When he was about to go upstairs, when Uncle Vernon actually spoke. Funny way to get to a wizard school. A train. Magic carpets all got punctures, have they? Ha Harry didn't say anything. Where is this school anyway? I don't know, said Harry, realizing this for the first time. He pulled the ticket Hagrid had given him for, out of his pocket. I just take the train from platform 9 and 3 quarters at 11 o'clock. He read. His aunt and uncle stared. Platform what? Nine and three quarters. Don't talk rubbish, said Uncle Vernon. There is no platform nine and three quarters. Put it on my ticket. Barking, said Uncle Vernon. Holy mad the lot of them. You'll see. You just wait. All right, we'll take you to King's Cross. We're going up to London anyway tomorrow. Or I wouldn't bother. Why are you going to London? Harry asked, trying to keep things friendly. Taking Dudley to the hospital. Got to get that ruddy, ruddy tail removed before he goes to smell things. Harry woke at five o'clock the next morning and was too excited and nervous to go back to sleep. He got up and pulled on his jeans because he didn't want to walk to the station in his wizard's robe. He changed on the train. He checked his Hogwarts list yet again to make sure he had everything he needed. He saw that Hedwig, Hedwig was shut safely in her cage and then passed the room, waiting for the nurses to get up. Two hours later, Harry's huge, heavy trunk was, had been loaded into the Dursley's car. Aunt Petunia had talked to Leanda sitting next to Harry, and, the, and they had set off. They reached King Cross at half past ten. Uncle Vernon dumped Harry's trunk onto a cart and wheeled it into the station for him. Harry thought this was strangely kind until Uncle Vernon stopped dead, facing the platform with a nasty grin on his face. Well, there you are, boy. Platform nine. Platform ten. Your platform should be somewhere in the middle, but they don't seem to have built it yet. He was quite right, of course. There was a big plastic number 9 over one platform, and a big plastic number over 10 over the next one. And in, in the middle, nothing at all. Have a good time, said Uncle Vernon with an even nastier smile. He left without another word. Harry turned and saw the dresses drive away. All three of them were laughing. Harry's mouth went rather dry. What on earth was he going to do? He was starting to attract a lot of funny looks because of Hedwig. He'd have to ask someone. He stopped a passing guard, but didn't dare mention Platform 9 and 3 quarters. The guard had never heard of Hogwarts, and when Harry couldn't tell, couldn't, and when Harry couldn't even tell him what part of the country it was in, he started to get annoyed, as though Harry was being stupid on purpose. Getting desperate, Harry asked for the, one, for the train that left at 11 o'clock, but the guard said there wasn't one. In the end, the guard strode away, muttering about time wasters. Harry was trying hard not to panic. According to the large clock over the arrivals board, he had 10 minutes left to get on the Hogwarts, to get on the train to Hogwarts, and he had no idea how to do it. He was stranded in the middle of a station with the truck he could hardly lift, a pocket full of wizard money, and a large owl. Hagrid must have forgotten to tell him something you had to do, like tapping the third brick on the left to get into Diagon Alley. He wondered if he should get out of his wand and start tapping the ticket inspector's stand between platforms 9 and 10. 
At that moment, a, a group of people passed just behind him and caught a few words they were saying. Packed with muggles, of course. Harry swam around. The speaker was a plump woman who was talking to four boys with all flaming red hair, each of them pushing a trunk like Harry's in front of him. And they had an owl. Hard hammering, Harry pushed his cart after them. They stopped, and so did he, just near, just near enough to hear what they were saying. No, what's the platform number? said the boy's mother. We're only in three quarters, piped a small girl, also red-headed, who was holding her hand. Mom, I can't, can't I go? You're not old enough, Ginny. Now be quiet. All right, Percy, you go first. What looked like the oldest boy marched toward platform nine and ten. Harry watched, careful not to blink in case he missed it. But just as the boy reached the dividing barrier between the two platforms, a large crowd of tourists came swarming in front of him, and by the time the last backpack had cleared, the boy had vanished. Fred, you're next, the plump woman said. I'm not Fred, I'm George, said the boy. Honestly, woman, you call ourselves our mother? You can't tell him, George. Sorry, George, dear. Only joking, I am Fred, said the boy, and off he went. His twin called after him to hurry up, and he must have done so. Because a second later he had gone. But now had he done it? But how had he done it? Well, the third brother was walking briskly toward the barrier, and he was almost there. And then, quite suddenly, he wasn't anywhere. There was nothing else for it. Excuse me, Harry said to the plump woman. Hello, dear, she said. First time in Hogwarts? Ron's new, too. She pointed at the last and youngest of her sons. He was tall, thin, and gangling with freckles and with freckles, big hands and feet, and a long nose, and a long nose. Yes, said Harry. The thing is, that the thing is, I, I don't know how to, how to get onto the platform, she said kindly, and Harry nodded. Not to worry, all you have to do is walk straight up the barrier between platforms nine and ten. Don't stop and don't be scared or you'll crash into it. That's very important. Best do it out a bit of a run if you're nervous. Go on, go now before Ron. Uh, okay, said Harry. He pushed the trolley, he pushed his trolley around and stood at the barrier. It looked very solid. He started to walk toward it, toward it. People jostled him on his way to platforms 9 and 10. Harry walked more quickly. He was going to smash right into that barrier and then he'd be in even more trouble. Leaning forward on his cart, he broke into a heavy run. The barrier was coming nearer and nearer. He wouldn't be able to stop. The cart was out of control. He was a foot away. He closed his eyes, ready for a, ready for a crash. It didn't come. He kept on running. He opened his eyes. A scarlet steam engine was waiting was waiting next to a platform packed with people. A sign overhead said Hogwarts Express, 11 o'clock. Harry looked behind him and saw a wrought iron archway where the barrier had been, with the, with the words platform nine and three quarters on it. He had done it. Smoke from the engine drifted over the heads of the chattering crowd, while cats of every color wound here and there between their legs. Owls hooted to one another in a disgruntled sort of way over the babble and scraping of heavy drops. The first few carriages were already packed with students, some hanging out of the window to talk to their families, some fighting over seats. Harry pushed his cart off the, off down, down the platform in search of an empty seat. He passed a round-faced boy who was saying, Friend, I've lost my turn again. Oh, Neville, he heard the old woman sigh. A boy with dreadlocks was surrounded by a small crowd. Give us a look, Lee. Go on. The boy lifted the lid of a box in his arms, and the people around him shrieked and yelled as though something poked out. Of, poked out. As, as something inside poked out in a long hairy leg. Harry pressed on through the crowd until he found an empty compartment near the end of the train. He put he Hedwig inside first and then started to shove and heave his trunk toward the train door. He had tried to lift it up the steps but could hardly raise one end and twice dropped it painfully on his foot. Want a hand? It was one of the red twins he'd followed into through the barrier. Yes, please, Harry panted. Oi, Fred, come here and help. With the twins' help, Harry's trunk was la as at last tucked away in a corner of the compartment. Thanks, said Harry, pushing the sweaty hair out of his eyes. What's that? said one of the twins, suddenly pointing at Harry's lightning scar. Blimey, said the other twin. Are you? He is, said the first twin. Aren't you? So he added to Harry. What? said Harry. Harry Potter, watched the twins. Oh, him. I mean, so, yes I am, said Harry. The two boys gawked at him, and Harry felt himself turning red. 
Then, to his relief, a, a voice came floating in through the train's open door. Fred, George, are you there? Come in, Mum. With the last look at Harry, the twins hopped off the train. Harry sat, ne Harry sat down next to the window, where, half hidden, he could watch the red-haired family on the platform and hear what they were saying. The mother had just to just taken on a handkerchief. Ron, you've got something on your nose. The youngest boy tried to jerk out of the way, but she grabbed him and began and began rubbing the end of his nose. Mom, get off! He wriggled free. Ah, has equal Ronnie got something on his nosey? Said one of the twins. Shut up, said Ron. Where's Percy? Said their mother. He's coming now. The oldest boy came striding into sight. He had already changed into his billowing black Hogwarts robe and noticed a shiny, a shiny silver badge on his chest with the letter P on it. Can't stay long, mother, he said. I'm up front. The prefects have got two compartments to themselves. Oh, are you prefect, Percy? Said one of the twins with an air of great surprise. You should have said something. We had no idea. <laughs> Hang on. I think I remember him saying something about it to the other twin. To the other twin. Once. Or twice. A minute. Or summer. Oh, shut up, said Percy the prefect. How come Percy gets new robes anyway, said one of the twins. Because he's a prefect, said their mother fondly. All right, dear. Well, have a good time. Send me an owl when you get there. She kissed Percy on the cheek and he, and he left. Then she turned to the twins. Now, you two, this year, you behave yourself. If I get one more owl telling me you've blown up a toilet, oh, blown up a toilet? We've never blown up a toilet. Great idea, though. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> it's not funny. And look after Ron. Don't worry. Ickle Ronikins is safe with us. Shut up, said Ronikin. He was almost as tall as the twins, and already his nose is still pink from where his mother had rubbed it. Hey, Mom, guess what? Guess who we just met on the train? Harry leaned ba back quickly so they didn't, so they couldn't see him looking. You know that black-haired kid who was near us on the station? You know who he is? Who? Harry Potter! Harry heard the little girl's voice. Oh, Mom, can I go on the train and see him? Mom, oh, please! You've already seen him, Ginny. And the poor boy isn't something you gobble at in a zoo. Is he really Fred? How do you know? Asked him, saw his scar. It's really there, like lightning. Poor dear, no wonder he was alone, I wonder. I, I wondered. He was ever so polite when he asked how to get on that platform. Never mind, do you think he remembers what you know who looks like? Their mother, their mother suddenly became very stern. I forbid you to ask him, Fred. No, don't you dare. As though he needs reminding of that on his first day at school. All right, keep your hair on. A whistle sounded on. A whistle sounded. Hurry up, said their mother. And the three boys climbed onto the train. They leaned out of the window for her to kiss them goodbye, and their younger sister began to cry. Don't, Ginny. We'll send you a load of owls. We'll send you a Hogwarts toilet seat. <laughs> George! Only joking, Mom. The train began to move, and Harry saw the boy's mother wave and their sister half laughing, half crying, running to keep up with the train until it gathered too much speed. Then she fell back and waved. Harry, wa Harry watched the girl and her mother disappear as the train rounded the corner. Houses flashed past the window. Harry felt a great leap of excitement. He didn't know what he was going to do, but it had, better, but it had to be better than what he was leaving behind. The door of the compartment slid in, and the youngest red-headed boy came in. Anyone sitting there? He asked, pointing to the seat opposite of Harry. Everywhere else is full. Harry shook his head and the boy sat down. He glanced down at Harry and then quickly looked out the window, pretending he hadn't looked. Harry saw that he still had a black mark on his nose. Hey, Ron, turns her back. Listen, we're going down to the middle of the train. Lee Jordan's got a giant tarantula down there. Right, mumbled Ron. Harry, said the other twin. Did we introduce ourselves? Fred and George Weasley, and this is the Ron, our brother. See you later, then. Bye, said Harry and, said Harry and Ron. The twins slid the, slid the compartment door shut behind them. Are you really Harry Potter? Ron blurted out. Harry nodded. Oh, well, I thought it might have been one of Fred and George jokes. And, and said Ron, and you've really got, you know, he pointed at Harry's forehead. Harry pulled back the bangs to show the run, lightning scar. Ron stared. So that's where you know who... Yes, said Harry, but I can't remember it. Nothing, said Ron eagerly. Well, I remember a lot of green light, but nothing else. Wow, said Ron. 
He sat, he sat and stared at Harry for a few moments then. As though he'd realized what he was doing, he looked quickly out of the window again. Are all of your family wizards? Asked Harry, who had found Ron just as interesting as Ron found him. Ron found, found him? Uh, yes, I think so, said Ron. But Mom's got a second cousin who's an accountant, but we never really talk about him. So you must know loads of magic already. The Weasleys were clearly one of those old wizarding families the pale boy and Diagon Alley had talked about. I heard you went to live with muggles, said Ron. What are they like? Horrible. Well, not all of them. My aunt and uncle and cousin, cousin, though. I wish I had three wizard brothers. Five, said Ron. For some reason, he was looking gloomy. I'm the sixth in our family in, to go to Hogwarts. But could you say... Wait, you could say I've got a lot to live up to. Bill and Charlie have left already. Bill is head boy and Charlie was captain in Quidditch. Now Percy's a prefect and Fred and George mess around a lot. But they still got really good marks and everyone thinks they're really funny. Everyone expects me to do as well as them. But if I do, but if I do, it's no big deal because they did it first. You never get anything new either with five brothers. I've got Bill's old robes, Charlie's old wand, and Percy's old rat. Ron reached inside his jacket and pulled out a fat grey rat which was which was asleep. His name's Scabbers and he's useless. He hardly ever wakes up. Percy got an owl from my dad for being made a prefect, but they couldn't afford... I mean, I got Scabbers instead. Ron's ears went pink. He seemed to think he had said too much because he went back to staring at the window. Harry didn't think there was anything wrong with not being able to afford an owl. Although he never saved any... He had never he never had any money in his life until a month ago, and he told Ron so. I bet all about having to wear Dudley's little clothes and never getting proper birthday presents. This seemed to cheer Ron up. And until Hagrid told me, I didn't know anything about being a wizard, or my, about my parents, Voldemort. Ron gasped. What? said Harry. You said you know whose name, said Ron, sounding both shocked and impressed. I have thought you of all people. I'm not trying to be brave or anything, saying the name, said Harry. I just never knew you shouldn't, see what I mean? I've got loads to learn, I bet. He added, voicing for the first time something had, had been worrying, worrying him a lot lately. I bet I'm the worst in the class. You won't be. There's loads of people who come from muggle families, and they learn quick enough. While they had been talking, the train had carried them out of London. They were now speeding past fields of cow and sheep. They were quiet for a time, watching the fields and lanes flick past. Around half past twelve, there was a great, there was a great clattering outside in the corridor, and a smiling, dimpled woman slipped back into the door and said, "Anything off the cart, dears?" <sighs> Harry, who hadn't had any breakfast, leapt to his feet, but Ron's ears went pink again, and he muttered that he brought sandwiches. Harry went out into the corridor. corridor. He had never had any money for candy with the Dursleys, and now that he had pockets rattling with gold and silver, he was ready to buy as many Mars bars as he could carry. But the woman didn't have money Mars bars. What she did have were Birdie's Bot's Every Flavor Beans, Dribble's Best Blowing Gum, Chocolate Frogs, Pumpkin Pasties, Culture Cakes, Licorice Wands, and a number of other strange things he had never seen in his life. Not wanting to miss anything, he got some of everything and paid the woman eleven sickles and seven bronze nuts. Seven bronze nuts. Ron stared as Harry brought it all back into the apartment and tipped it onto the empty seat. Hungry, are you? Starving, said Harry, taking a large bite out of a pumpkin pasty. Ron had gotten out two, a, lump of, a lumpy package and unwrapped it. There were four sandwiches inside. He pulled one of them apart and said, She always forgets I don't like corned beef. Stop you for one of these said Harry, holding up a pasty. Go on. You don't want all this. It's just all dry. She hasn't got much time, he added quickly, you know, with the five of us. Go on, have a pasty, said Harry, who had never had anything to share it before, or indeed anyone to share it with. It was a nice feeling, sitting there with Ron, eating their way through all of Harry's pasties, cakes, and candies. The sandwiches lay forgotten. What are these? Harry asked Ron, holding up a pack of chocolate frogs. They're not really frogs, are they? He was starting to feel that nothing would surprise him. With, that nothing would surprise him. No, said Ron. But see what the card is. I'm missing a, a gripper. What? Of course you wouldn't know. Chocolate frogs have cards inside. 
you know, to collect famous witches and wizards. I got about 500, but I haven't got Agrippa or Ptolemy. Harry unwrapped his chocolate frog and picked up the card. It showed a man's face. He wore half moon glasses and had a long crooked nose and glowing silver hair, beard, and mustache. Underneath the picture was the name Albus Dumbledore. So this is Dumbledore, said Harry. Don't tell me you never heard of Dumbledore, said Ron. Can I have a frog? I might get a gripper. Thanks. Harry turned over his card and read, Albus Dumbledore, currently headmaster of Hogwarts. Considered by many of the greatest wizards of all modern times, Dumbledore is particular fam particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945 for the discovery of the 12 uses of dragon's blood and his work on alchemy with his partner, Nicholas Flamel. Professor Dumbledore enjoys chamber music and, tem and ten pin bowling. Harry turned the card back, in back over and saw to his astonishment that Dumbledore's face had disappeared. He's gone! Well, you can't expect him to hang around all day, said Ron. He'll be back. No, I've got Morgana again, and I've got about six of her. Do you want it? You can start collecting. Ron's eyes strayed to the pile of chocolate frogs waiting to be unwrapped. Help yourself, said Harry. But in, you know, the muggle world, people just stay put in photos. Do they? What, they don't move at all? Ron said in amaze. Weird. Harry stared as Dumbledore settled back into the picture on his card and gave him a small smile. Ron was, more, Ron, Ron was more interested in eating the frogs than looking at the famous witches in Richard's cart. But Harry couldn't keep his eyes off of them. Soon he had not only uh, Dumbledore and Morgana, but the, I don't know, say that, of Woodcroft, Albergrinian, Sears, Parsilius, and Merlin. He finally tore his eyes off of the Drudius Cleodon, Cleodonna. Are those all just names? Yes. Yes. Um, he was scratching her nose to open up a bag of birdie blots every flavor beans. You want to be careful with those, Ron warned Harry. When you say every flavor, they mean every flavor. You know, you get all the ordinary ones like chocolate and peppermint and, mar and marmalade, but then, they, but then you get spinach and liver and tripe. George reckoned he has a booger flavor one once. <laughs> Ron picked up a green bean, looked at it carefully, and bit into the corner. Blah! They sprouts! They had a good time eating the every flavor beans. Harry got toast, coconut, baked beans, strawberry, curry, grass, coffee, sardine, and was even brave enough to nibble off the end of a funny gray one which Ron wouldn't touch, which turned out to be pepper. The countryside was now flying past the window and was becoming wilder. The neat fields had gone, now there were woods, twisting rivers and dark green hills. There was a knock at the door of the compartment, and a round-faced boy Harry had passed on the platform. He looked cheerful. Sorry, he said, but have you seen a toad at all? When they shook his head, he wailed. I've lost him! He keeps getting away from me! He'll turn up, said Harry. Yes, said the boy miserably. Well, if you see him, he left. I don't know why he's so bothered. If I'd bought a toad, I'd lose it as quick as I could. Mind you, I dropped scabbers so I can't talk. The rat was still snoozing on Ron's lap. He might have died and he wouldn't know the difference, said Ron in disgust. I, I tried to turn him yellow yesterday to make him look more interesting, but the spell didn't work. I'll show you, look. He rummaged around in his trunk and pulled out a very battered looking wand. It was chipped in places and something I was glinting at the end. Unicorn's hair nearly poking out anyway. Anyway, he had just raised his wand when the compartment door slid open again. The toadless boy was back, but this time he had a girl with him. She was already wearing her new Hogwarts robe. Has anyone seen a toad? That was lost one, she said. She had a bossy sort of voice, lots of bushy brown hair and rather large front teeth. We, we already told him we haven't seen it, said Ron, but the girl wasn't listening. She was looking at the wand in his hand. Oh, are you doing magic? Let's see it then. She sat down. Ron looked taken aback. Uh, all right. He cleared his throat. Sunshine daisies, butter mellow. Turn this stupid fat rat yellow. He waved his wand, but nothing happened. Scabber stayed gray and fast asleep. <laughs> are you sure that's a real spell? Said the girl. Well, it's not very good, is it? I've tried a few simple spells just for practice, and it's not all worked for me. 
Nobody in my family's magic at all. And it was never, it was ever such a surprise when I got my letter. But I was ever so pleased, of course. I mean, it's the very best school of witchcraft there is. I've heard, I've learned all our course books by heart, of course. I hoped it would be enough. I'm Hermione Granger, by the way. Who are you? She said all this very fast. Harry looked at Ron and was in relief to see his stunned face that he hadn't learned all the course books by heart either. <laughs> I'm Ron Weasley, Ron muttered. Harry Potter, said Harry. Are you really? said Hermione. I know all about you. Of course, I've got a few extra books for background reading, and you're, mo and you're in modern magical history and the rise and fall of the dark arts and great wizarding event in the 20th century. Am I? said Harry, feeling dazed. Goodness, didn't you know? I have found out everything. I could if it if it was me. Do you do either of do either look do either of you know what house you'll be in? I've been asking around and I hope I am the Gryffindor. It sounds by far the best. I hear Dumbledore himself was in it. I suppose Ravenclaw wouldn't be too bad. Anyway, we better go and look for Neville's toad. You two you two had better change, you know. I expect we'll be there soon. And she left, taking the toad this boy with her. Whatever house I'm in, I hope she's not in it, said Ron. <laughs> He threw his wand back into the trunk. Stupid spell. George gave me. George gave it to me. I bet he knew it was a dud. What houses are you? Are your brothers in? Asked Harry. Gryffindor said Ron. Gloom seemed to be settling on on him. Mom and Dad were in it too. I don't know what they'll say if I'm not. I suppose Ravenclaw would be would would be too would be too bad. But imagine if they put me in Slytherin. That's the house. Vo I mean, you know who was in it? Yeah said Ron. He flopped back into his seat, looking depressed. You know, I think the ends of Scabber's whiskers are a bit lighter, said Harry, trying to take Ron's mind off houses. So, what are your oldest brothers doing now after they left anyway? Harry was wondering what a wizard did after he finished school. Charlie's in Romania studying dragons, and Bill's in Africa doing something for Gringotts. Did you hear about the Gringotts? It's been all over Daily Prophet, but I don't suppose you get that with muggles. Someone tried to rob a high security vault. Harry stared. Really? What happened to them? Nothing. That's why it's such big news. They haven't been caught. My dad says it must have been a powerful dark wizard to get round the green rocks. But they didn't. But they don't take. But they don't think they took anything. That's what's odd. Of course, everyone gets sta scared when something like this happens. In case you know who's behind it. Harry turned this news over in his mind. He was starting to get a prickle of fear every time you know he was mentioned. He was supposed to be, he was, he supposed this was all part of entering the magic word, world, but it had been a lot more comfortable seeing Voldemort without worrying. What's your Quidditch team? Ron asked. Er, I don't know any, Harry confessed. What? Ron looked dumbfounded. Oh wait, it's the best game in the world. And he was off, explaining all about the four balls and positions of the seven players, describing famous games he'd been to with his brothers and the broomstick he'd like to get if he had the money. He was just taking Harry through the finger points of the game when the compartment the door slid open again, but it wasn't Neville, the toadless, the toadless boy, or Hermione Granger this time. Three boys entered, and Harry recognized the middle one as the one. It was a pale boy from Ma Madame Malkin's robe shop. He was looking at Harry with a lot more interest than he's shown back in Diagon Alley. Is that the end? No, I'm just going to stop there. Oh, okay. I'm just All right. Will you um, get him? So, no, he didn't want to read anymore, but I will if oh. you don't want to read anymore. Oh, no, I thought he didn't, I thought okay. he didn't want to No, he's read. finished. You can keep going. Okay. I thought you just wanted a break. Yeah. Well, it's almost done anyway. Okay. okay. <laughs> Were you still videoing? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sorry. Because if I gonna... stop, I don't have a way to push them together. Okay, are you just going to edit all this out? No, it's fine. It's okay. just real life. It's good. <gasps> Is it true? He said. They're saying all down the train that Harry Potter's in this compartment. So it's you, is it? Yes, said Harry. He was looking at the other boys. Both of them were the thick, whoa, were the thick set and looked extremely mean. Standing on either side of the pale boy, they look like bodyguards. Oh, this is Crab and this is Goyle, said the pale boy care carelessly, noticing where Harry was looking. And my name's Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. Okay, pause. There are any inappropriate words, go ahead and edit them. Okay. I haven't looked ahead at this chapter, but do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Okay, keep going. You're good. 
There probably aren't any, but just in case. Um, where was I? Ron gave a slight cough, which might have been hiding this, uh, snigger. Draco Malfoy looked at him. I think my name's funny, do you? No need to ask who you are. My father told me all the Weasleys have red hair, freckles, and more children than they can afford. He turned back to Harry. You'll soon find out some wizarding families are much better than the others, Potter. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. He held out his hand to shake Harry's, but Harry didn't take it. I think I can tell who the wrong sort are for me. Thanks. He said coolly. Draco Malfoy didn't go red, but a pink tinge appeared in his pale cheeks. I'd be careful if I were you, Potter. He said. Unless you're a bit politer, you'll go the same way as your parents. They don't. They didn't know it was good for them either. You hang around with the rip rap with the rip rap like the Weasleys and that Hagrid, and it'll rub off on you. Both Harry and Ron stood up. Say that again, Ron said, his face as red as his hair. Oh, you're going to fight us, are you? Malfoy sneered. Unless you get out now, said Harry, who was m more bravely than he felt, because Cub and Goyle were a whole lot bigger than him and Ron. But we don't feel like leaving, do we, boys? We've eaten all our food, and you, and you still seem to have some. Goyle reached toward the chalk of frogs next to Ron. Ron leapt forward, but he, before he'd so much as touched Goyle, Goyle let out a horrible yell. Scabbers the rat was hanging off his finger, sharp little teeth sunk deep into co co Goyle's knuckle. Crab and Malfoy backed away as Goyle swung Scabbers round and round, howling. And when Scabbers finally flew off and hit the window, all three of them disappeared at once. Perhaps they thought there were more rats looking among the streets. Or perhaps they heard footsteps, because a second later, Hermione Granger had come in. What has been going on? She said, looking at the sweets all over the floor and Ron picking up Scabbers by his table. Tail. I think he's been knocked out, Ron said to Harry. He looked closer at Scabbers. No, I don't believe it. He's gone back to sleep. <laughs> and so he had. You've met Malfoy before. Harry explained about their meeting in Diagon Alley. I've heard of this family, said Ron darkly. They were some of the first to come to, to our side after you know who disappeared. Uh, said they've been bewitched. My dad doesn't believe it. He says Malfoy's father didn't need an excuse to go over to the dark side. He turned to Hermione. He turned to Hermione. Can we help you with something? You better hurry up and put your robes on. I've just been out to the front to ask the conductor. He says he says we're nearly there. You haven't been fighting, have you? You'll be in trouble before we even get there. Scabbers has been fighting, not us," <laughs> said Ron, scowling at her. "Would you mind leaving while we change?" All right, I only came in here because people outside were behaving very childishly, racing up and down the corridors, and said Hermione in a snippy voice. And you've got dirt in your nose, by the way, did you know? Ron glared at her as she, as she left. Harry peered out the window. It was getting dark. He could see the mountains and forests under a deep purple sky. The train did seem to be slowing down. He and Ron took off their jackets and pulled on their long black robes. Ron's were a bit short for him, and he could see his sneakers underneath. A voice echoed through the train. We will be reaching Hogwarts in five minutes' time. Please leave your luggage on the train. It will be taken to the school separately. Harry's stomach clutched with, ner with nerves, and, and Ron, we saw, looked pale into her speckles. They crammed their pockets with the last of the sweets and joined the crowd uh, thronging through the corridor. The train slowed right down and finally stopped. People pushed their way toward the door and out onto a tiny, dark platform. Harry shivered in the cold night air. Then a lamp came bobbing over the heads of the students, and Harry re heard a familiar voice. First years, first years over here. All right there, Harry. Hagrid's big, big hairy face beamed over the sea of heads. Come on, follow me. Any more first years? Mind your step. No, first years, follow me. Slipping and s stumbling, they followed Hagrid down, down to what seemed to be a steep, narrow path. It was so dark on either side of them that, it, that Harry thought it must have been thick trees there. Nobody spoke much. Neville, the boy who kept losing his toy, sniffed and once or twice. You'll get your first. You, you'll get your first sight at Hogwarts in a second. In a sec, Hagrid called over his shoulder. Just round this bend here, there was a loud ooh. The narrow path had opened suddenly onto the edge of a great black lake. Lake, perched atop a high mountain on the other side, its windows sparkling in the starry night, was a vast castle with many turrets and towers. No more than four to a boat. 
Hagrid called, pointing to a fleet of little boats sitting in the water by shore. Harry and Ron were followed into their boats by, ne by Neville and uh, Hermione. Everyone in, shouted Hagrid, who had a boat to himself. Right then, forward! And the fleet of little boats moved all off all at once, gliding across the lake, which was smooth as glass. Everyone was silent, staring up at the great castle overhead. It towered over them as they sailed nearer and nearer to the cliff on which it stood. Head down! Uh, yelled Hagrid as the first boats reached the cliff. They all bent their heads in little boats, and the little boats carried them as though a curtain of ivy that hid, that hid the wide opening of the cliff face. They were carried along a dark tunnel, which seemed to be taking them right underneath the castle until they reached a kind of underground harbor or where they claimed out or where they clambered out onto rocks and pebbles. Oh you there, is this your toad? said Hagrid, who was checking the boats as people climbed out of them. Trevor cried Neville blissfully, holding out his hands. Then they clambered up a passageway in the rock after Hagrid's lamp, coming out at the last onto smooth damp grass right in the shadow of the castle. They walked up onto a flight of stone steps and crowded around a huge oak front door. Everyone here? You there? You still got your toad? Hagrid raised a gigantic fist and knocked three times on the castle wall. That's the end? Alright, what's the next chapter called? Let me find it. Oh, you just... Always the use a bookmark. The sorting hat. The sorting hat is next. Ha ha. Alright, tell beach bums to have a lovely Easter weekend. Have a great Easter. Bye.